It's the night of September 14, 1999. Girona Airport in Spain is enveloped in thunderstorms. Over 100 miles north, a Britannia Airways Boeing 757 makes its way towards the airport. On board are 236 passengers and 9 crew who boarded the plane at Cardiff in Wales. The passengers are part of a tour group, looking to escape the UK to the sunnier climates of Spain for a few days. They know that it is raining at Girona at the moment, but they have little idea of quite how bad the conditions are. In less than an hour's time, the plane will attempt to land in Girona and will end up skidding off the runway, crashing down into a field, breaking into three pieces and injuring 44 passengers. After the crash, investigators would piece together a series of highly improbable events which led to this accident. This is not a simple case of a runway overrun in rainy weather. In fact, the slippery runway had nothing to do with the crash. This is the story of how in certain conditions, one failure can set off a chain of failures, each of which is more serious than the last. What follows is the incredible story of Britannia Airways Flight 226 Alpha, the flight where everything that could go wrong did go wrong. The captain of this flight was highly experienced. He was 57 years old at the time and had amassed almost 17,000 hours of flying time, 3,500 of which were on the 757. The first officer was comparatively inexperienced. He was 33 years of age and had accumulated just under 1,500 hours of flying experience, most of which were on the 757. He would be flying the plane on this leg of the journey. The aircraft being used for this flight was a 7-year-old Boeing 757. The 757 was a relatively modern aircraft at the time of the crash, with an excellent safety record. However, a weakness in its design would prove fateful on this night. Before departure, the pilots had discussed the weather forecasts, and the captain decided to load an extra 15 minutes of holding fuel to allow for possible delays. They had decided on three alternate airports in case it was not possible to land at Girona. Pressure was high, however, as there were thunderstorms at two of these three airports. At a quarter past 11, when the aircraft was in radio range of Girona, the pilots contacted air traffic control asking for updated weather information. The air traffic controller informed them of the stormy conditions, noting that right now there was a storm to the southwest of the airport. The pilots began their descent, and the first officer asked the cabin crew to secure the cabin early. He also advised them and the passengers that the approach would be turbulent. The pilots were able to see the thunderstorms on their weather radar. In fact, a cabin crew member would later tell the captain that the aircraft had been hit by lightning on the left-hand side during the descent. The crew would continue the approach, however, as no damage had been done to the aircraft. The controller gave the pilots the option of an ILS approach to runway 20. The ILS, or instrument landing system, is a type of approach where pilots use their instruments to follow a pair of radio beacons down towards the runway. The ILS is especially useful during rainy or foggy weather when pilots can't see the runway out the window. This approach would have been relatively straightforward, however, given the pervading winds and the rain, and the fact that the runway had a downhill slope, the pilots decided that it would be safer to land in the opposite direction, on runway 02. This decision was prudent, but it would cause problems down the line. Runway 02 was not fitted with an ILS, and so the pilots would have to fly a more complex and old-fashioned type of instrument approach, known as a VOR DME approach. This would significantly increase their workload as they neared the airport. When they got ATC clearance to fly this approach, the captain took control of the aircraft from the first officer. He was more experienced and would be better able to fly this more complicated approach in the poor weather conditions. From here on, things started to get worse by the minute. At about 20 past 11, the captain deployed the speed brakes to help the aircraft descend faster. However, during the approach preparations with the first officer, he took his hand off the speed brake lever and in doing so, forgot to retract it for 14 minutes. This dramatically increased the fuel burn as the engines had to work harder to maintain speed and altitude. In total, 400 kilograms of fuel was used up by keeping the speed brakes out. This decrease in fuel, combined with the bad weather, began to restrict the pilot's options as they neared the airport. As they continued their approach, the turbulence from the storm grew more intense. In fact, it got so strong that it knocked the captain's approach charts out of its clip on his control column. He tried to pick it up, but was unable to retrieve it. From here on, he would rely on the first officer calling out speeds and altitudes in order to fly the approach correctly. Finally, for the first time during the treacherous approach, and just over one minute from touchdown, the captain saw the runway lights. At this point, however, the controller contacted the plane with bad news. She told the crew that the wind had started coming from the opposite direction, and was now coming from behind them at 12 knots. Landing 12 knots fast on a wet runway in a storm is a dangerous proposition, so the captain chose to abandon the approach and to come around to land in the opposite direction. He climbed the aircraft back up to 5,000 feet and began to circle to land on runway 20. During the first approach, the pilots had agreed that if they were unable to land on the first attempt, they would divert to Barcelona. But after checking the weather in Barcelona, they found that it was poor as well, 
possibly worse than it was in Girona. They discovered that they had just enough fuel to make one more attempt at landing in Girona, so they decided to go ahead with a second approach. Given their proximity to the airport, the pilots neglected to do even a short approach briefing. They started descending to intercept the ILS to runway 20. However, just as they began their descent, an important message popped up on their flight management computer. It indicated that if they diverted to Barcelona, they would land with less than the 2,800 kilograms of fuel set by their company as the minimum landing fuel. This would get them in trouble with the airline, and they now felt under increasing pressure to make a success of this second landing at Girona. At 15 minutes to midnight, the runway approach lights came into view through the windscreen. Turbulence was rocking the plane from side to side, and the sound of rain in the windscreen was immense. Less than 30 seconds from touchdown, the captain disengaged the autopilot and began to fly the plane manually. At one point, he noticed that the aircraft was getting high compared to the ideal approach angle, and he immediately pushed the nose down to correct for this. When he looked up from his instruments, all he saw out the window was blackness. With no idea what had happened, the captain held the plane in its current position until suddenly the ground proximity warning called out, Sink rate, sink rate. The aircraft slammed onto the runway nose first and bounced back into the air. The sudden deceleration of the impact onto the runway pushed the captain forward in his seat, which in turn pushed the control column forward, pushing the aircraft back down hard onto the runway a second time. This impact was so severe that it pushed the nose landing gear up into the fuselage, thrusting its assembly into the electronics compartment below the cockpit. This instantly wiped all electrical power from the aircraft and disabled not only the cockpit instruments and lights, but the spoilers, thrust reversers, anti-skid systems, auto brakes, and even the flight data recorder. Unbelievably, the worst malfunction was yet to come. In the control tower, all the controller could see as she looked towards the runway was a shower of sparks spurting down the runway and disappearing into the darkness. She immediately pressed the crash alarm button, but was horrified to find out that it wasn't working. Back in the aircraft, the situation was about to deteriorate drastically. As the nose wheel assembly crashed through the lower fuselage, it snapped two of the four cables connecting the engine throttles in the cockpit to the engines themselves. By sheer bad luck, the two cables it snapped were the ones which decreased thrust to the engines. The two remaining cables were responsible for increasing thrust to the engines. As a result of this, the engines began to spool up to high power. The aircraft was now sliding out of control along the runway without electrical power and with full engine thrust. There was nothing the pilots could do to stop the aircraft now. The plane continued down the runway on its nose for over a kilometre before sliding off at high speed into the wet grass to the right of the runway. It slammed into a small hill and briefly became airborne before careening through the airport perimeter fence and smashing down into a field where it broke into three pieces and ground to a halt. At the point of this final impact, the captain hit his head on the window post and was knocked unconscious. The cabin was in disarray, with several rows of seats having been torn from the floor and bags and overhead bins scattered everywhere. Incredibly, most of the passengers were completely uninjured. Within minutes, the cabin crew had evacuated all passengers. The captain regained consciousness shortly afterwards, and he and the first officer were able to leave the aircraft as well. However, as the passengers stood for minutes in the pitch darkness in the wet field, they realised that no help was arriving. While most of the passengers had escaped unscathed, 44 had been injured. The tower controller who had seen the sparks coming from the aircraft after it touched down had no idea what had happened to it. After the crash alarm button had not worked, she had called the fire station and told them that she had lost contact with the plane after it crash landed. She didn't know where it was or what happened to it, she told them, but she correctly figured that it must be at the southern end of the airport. Girona only had a small number of fire engines, but they all rushed to the southern end of the runway only to find no trace of the plane. They then quickly made their way to the north end of the runway and couldn't find it there either. Incredibly, a passenger had walked all the way from the crippled aircraft across the runway and tarmac to the terminal, where he came across the airport's chief safety officer. From here, the safety officer jumped into his vehicle and sped towards the plane. When he got to the airport perimeter fence, he came across the fire brigade, who had just discovered the aircraft moments earlier as well. They were trying to get through the fence and then across the muddy rain sodden field where the aircraft and its passengers were located. Finally, after 18 minutes looking for the plane, and another 6 minutes trying to reach it in the mud, the firefighters made it to the passengers. The rain had been so bad that some passengers were literally stuck in the mud and had to be rescued. Because of the location of the aircraft and the location of the field it was in, it took over an hour for all of the passengers to be brought to the terminal, and the injured transferred to hospital. One of the passengers who was transferred to hospital was released after it was suspected that he'd only suffered minor injuries. However, five days after the accident, he died of what was later discovered to be undetected internal injuries. Miraculously, all of the other hospitalised passengers were released soon after being admitted.
The final report into the accident was produced by Spain's Civil Aviation Accident and Incident Investigation Commission. The investigators interviewed a number of witnesses and found that the airport lights went out at least three or four times on the night of the crash as a result of lightning, one of which was right as Britannia Flight 226 Alpha was about to land. By interviewing both pilots, investigators found that they never even saw the runway lights turn off, as they had been looking at their instruments the entire time. This was highly disorientating, as the pilots simply found that nothing was in front of them when they looked up out the window. The pilots were further taken by surprise by the first impact of the runway because the usual altitude callouts 50, 40, 30, 20, 10, had been overridden by the sync rate alert, which only tells the pilots that they are descending too fast, but doesn't say how high they are off the ground. The startle effect of completely losing sight with the runway may have prevented the captain from initiating a go-round, which is the standard procedure when sight with the runway is lost. It is also likely that the high workload the crew had been under in the previous minutes had contributed to the fact that they didn't go around when they lost sight of the runway. They had been battling rough weather and this was their second approach to a different runway than the other one they had briefed and on top of that, they were low on fuel and were under pressure to land at Girona so they wouldn't have to explain to their company why they landed in Barcelona with less than the minimum allowed fuel. The crew undoubtedly felt under immense pressure to make this approach work and this may have further contributed to their incredulity when the runway lights simply vanished just seconds from touchdown. Despite a seemingly impossibly unlucky set of circumstances and compounding failures, it is miraculous that the aircraft slid off the runway exactly where it did. If the plane had left the runway even just a second earlier, it would have crashed into the trees, breaking up into many pieces and likely killing many on board. Alternatively, if it had left the runway a few seconds later, it would have crashed into more trees and then had a steeper drop off onto the field below. While it may seem like an accident like this, with all of its unfortunate coincidences, is impossible to prevent, the final report made a number of safety recommendations aimed at reducing the chances that similar events would occur in future. These included recommended that Boeing redesign the housing of the nose gear and electrical bay so that future nose gear collapses don't result in a total loss of aircraft systems. The report also recommended that the European Aviation Safety Agency mandate training on go-rounds after the decision to land has been made. The report even recommended that Girona Airport level the ground around the runway and remove the trees so that any aircraft which crash there in future don't have to rely on luck to avoid these deadly obstacles. If you found this video interesting, subscribe for more weekly air crash documentaries. Let me know in the comments if there are any air accidents or incidents you'd like to see covered, and I'll do my best to feature them in future videos. Thanks again for watching.